Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Amma ba'da habita fillah. Continue on in our study of Shara Sunnah lil Imam Ismail ibn Yahya al-Muzani who died 264 Hijri. Rahmatullah alayhi rahmatin wasi'ah. Continuing on our study of his treaty, Shara Sunnah, which as we continue to uh, discover and delve into this treaties, we see that these are masail and issues that the Salaf, the Salaf al Salih, Ridwan Allahi alayhim, that they gave the utmost attention and importance. And it shows us how the sciences of Islam, how they were preserved and how they developed, and these issues of itiqad, these issues of uh, creed and menhaj or methodology, how they were a part of a process. Although they came from the book and the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and as we also stated prior to this, that the Salaf, uh, uh, some of the Masail, they became issues in Masail due to the expansion of Ahla Bid'ah. That Ahla Bid'ah appeared and they began to grow and grow in numbers and come up with new doubts and ways of understanding the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this was something which made the Salaf react to this because they were the defenders of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the carriers of the Sunnah. So it became imperative for them to respond to the shubahat and the doubts and to write in order to defend the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, write books like this, like Shara Sunnah and the many uh, kutub uh, that expounded the itiqad of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And so we reach the portion of the treaties, which is a very important part of the treaties, and we'll try to give it its right, and may Allah grant us success in doing so, because this is one of the first ways uh, Ahl al-Bid'ah had uh, went astray, that one of the first areas in which people began to deviate regarding the creed of Ahl sunnah and that had to do uh, in, within the Bab of Tawheed with the Sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It had to do with the divine names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> so Imam al-Muzni, uh, in his chapter of the book, which is the next uh, portion of the treaties, a Sifat. So here a Sifat or a Sifa Asifa is the, the singular for, as a linguistic term, we would call as a descriptor or an adjective. Okay? But sifat here, when the Salaf were talking about sifat, they were talking about in, the, uh, in regards to Tawheed, meaning in regards to the divine names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. And so, Imam Muslim said, وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ وَقُدْرَةُ وَقُدْرَةِ اللَّهِ وَنَعْتُهُ وَسِفَاتُهُ كَمِلَاتٌ غَيْرُ مَخْلُقَاتٌ دَائِمَاتٌ أَزِلِيَاتٌ وَلَيْسَ بِمُحْتَثَاتٌ فَتُبِيدٌ وَلَا كَانَ رَبُّنَا نَاقِسٌ فَيُزِيدٌ Imam, uh, Imam al-Muzani, he said, and the words of Allah, the power of Allah, his description and his attributes are all perfect. They are not created. 
They, you know, they were not created. His sifat are not created. And this also, as you can see, some of the logic of the, the treaties that Imam al-Muzni, in, uh, in writing this treatise, and in the journey that we've embarked on by studying this treatise, we see he went from the, uh, talking about the Qur'an. He was talking about the Qur'an, Kalam Allah, which is what? What did we learn? We learned that it is one, uh, the Kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is from the divine sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Kalam of Allah are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the speech of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. It is divine. It is uncreated. And that's why the Salaf emphasized uncreated. So here from there, from moving from talking about the uh, Kalam Allah, the speech of Allah, when we talked about the Quran, which was the last lesson, Imam al-Muzni now moved from that which was khas, that which was uh, very specific, because Kalam Allah falls under sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It falls under the attributes of Allah. To now which is am, that which is general. Okay? Al khas al al am. So he he uh, said that and the words of Allah, the power of Allah, his his uh, description and his attributes are all perfect. So that's what we learned also from the uh, that all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sifat are divine and perfect. They are not created and they're uncreated. So this is one of the points of contention with uh, between Ahlul Hadith, Ahlul Sunnah, and the uh, other groups like the Jahmiyyah, the Mu'tazila, and the later, the Asha'ira, and other uh, groups and sects that arose throughout Islamic history, which deviated with regards to in the area of Sifat in the area of the divine attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we'll try to uh, go into some of those points in relation to our treaties, perhaps at the end of this uh, lesson or uh, maybe in the next lesson, because it's very relevant. So we need to have some uh, strong tesor or a strong uh, understanding of how they deviated, why to give us some, some background on why these ulama of Ahl Sunnah, why did they write books like Shara Sunnah, Imam Barbahari, here Shara Sunnah, uh, Lil uh, Mazini, and uh, Iman, uh, and, and all these other treaties, Shara, uh, it, uh, Shara Usul Ittiqara Ahl Sunnah by Al Alaqai, uh, As Sunnah Lil Khalal, and all of these other uh, texts, and why. From amongst those texts, did they emphasize sifat? Why was it such an issue? Why wouldn't it be simple enough for us to mention a, a few ayat like laysa kamit cliche wa sami'un basir and 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 push through? However, the point being is that many groups they deviated with regards to sifat, and in the the uh, these groups when they appeared, they did not deviate with regards to. In general, the deviation of the things that we find today of deviating with regards to uh, rububiyah, lordship, and deviating regarding al-uluhiyah, which is that uh, worship be directed to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The early sect, instead, because it was so close to the time of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and the tabi'in, with tabi tabi'in, during their time, that... Uh, this is, they were closer in understanding some of those base aspects of, of Tawheed. However, they began to, because of philosophy and other foreign ideologies and so forth, they began coming into contact with other religions that they began to question uh, in regards to issues of Sifat uh, regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, issues of his his um, his divine attributes and his name and, and what the implication was by affirming his, his sifat. So we will talk about that uh, inshallah ta'ala when the chance arises. And so Imam al-Muzani, he said about these sifat, he said they are eternal and forever. His sifat are eternal and forever, and they are not newly created. 
And we already said they're not created at all. So they will not perish. So our Lord is not deficient. So he will not increase in anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't increase in knowledge. He subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't increase in any of his sifat because he tabarak wa ta'ala possesses perfect sifat. And nothing in his creation, we can't even, uh, you know, these are, uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ There is nothing that resembles him, and he is the all-hearing and all-seeing. So we learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sifat are perfect. There is no resemblance in the creation. His sifat are uncreated. And... His sifat are divine and perfect. Then the Imam said, Jallat sifatuhu an shabhi sifat al makhlukin. Wa qasarat anhu fitanul wasifin. قريب بالإجابة عند السؤال بعيد بتعزز تعزز لا ينال عال على عرشه بائن من خلقه موجود وليس ليس بمعدوم ولا مفقود The Imam, Imam al-Mazni Muzni rahmatullah he then said about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said at his attributes are far above having any resemblance to the attributes of the creation. And the most intelligent describers, meaning those people who try to describe, uh, uh, cannot comprehend him. The most intelligent of those people who try to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they can't comprehend him, it, uh, comprehend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't know the cave, as we talked about it, as we talked about Ar-Rahman al arsh isto and that was the first chapter. The most merciful rose above his throne. Ahlul Sunnah affirms that. Istawa is from his sifat. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is istawin ala al-arshi. That he is, a, he is above, he's ala al arshi. He's above his arsh. He's above his throne in a manner that suits his majesty. And the kafia we don't know. The how, we don't know. We just affirm it as he affirmed it. And we believe in it as he wants us to believe in it. And we do not negate it. And we do not um, distort it. Nor do we try to misrepresent it or misinterpret those divine sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we accept it as it is. Those are... Uh, principles of Ahl Sunnah. Those are principles of Ahl Sunnah in the Bab of Sifat with regards to the divine attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's very important for us to understand that and to affirm what Allah affirmed about Himself and understand the relationship about uh, in these chapters of Ittaqad, these chapters that we're studying in this book, how they relate to one another. And how some of them are actually uh, almost a part of one another or they come as issues, in fact, under other issues. Because here when we talk about uh, Estoa, which was the first uh, chapter that he, he rose above his throne in a manner that suits his majesty without making a resemblance and we don't know how. This has to do with the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, the issue of the Qur'an being the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, kalam of Allah. That also, this has to do with the divine sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now we're studying sifat in a general sense. So Imam Mazani, rahmatullah then he said, His attributes are far above having any resemblance to the attributes of the creation and the most intelligent of those people who attempt to describe him cannot comprehend him. So the best of the people, the best of the <coughs> best of the scholars, the best of the people who are well known in the sciences, they they can't understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah did not give them that, that knowledge of the unseen, but he gave us what would suffice us to worship him and him alone. And to get to Jannah. He is near with an answer for those who ask. So for those who supplicate to him, he tabarakotala is near. He is far with might that does not no harm. He is above his throne, separate from his creation. He is in existence and not in non-existence, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. Nor is he absent and he's present, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because the people of Ahl al-Kalam, some of those, uh, the, the uh, sects that we mentioned, like the Mu'tazila, Jahmiya, uh, Ash'ira, and other groups, that they were known as Ahl al-Kalam. And they used a lot of the intellect. They used their intellect basically to try to defend what they understood of the Sifat and to try to understand the Sifat to negate and make uh, what would seem uh, implausible plausible for them. So meaning a lot of these groups, they arose and they were refuting one another. So refutation is not new in Islam, nor is it restricted to Ahl Sunnah. Ahl Bid'ah refuted one another and Ahl Bid'ah tried to refute Ahl Sunnah. So there's been raging debates throughout the history of Islam. That's why uh, you find essentially from this time period, two main schools of thought what they referred to as Ahla Hadith and Ahla Kalam. And Ahla Hadith were Ahla Sunnati wal Jama'ah. That they basically looked at the text, and especially the Sifat, and they took them in their literal sense. And they, as a madhab and a methodology, they looked at these principles, they looked at them at, at their apparent meaning. And so they didn't, and when it came to Sifat, as we mentioned, they didn't distort the meanings. They didn't make a resemblance between Allah and his creation. They didn't negate the Sifat, but they affirmed the Sifat. And they didn't know, they didn't ask how, but rather they affirmed it as they were and uh, understood the linguistic meaning and the meaning of those Sifat but they don't know the cave, the, the full kafiya. This is uh, from the issues of the ghayb. This is from the issues, umur al ghaybiyya. This is from the issues of the unseen. So we affirm what Allah affirms about himself. We affirm what the Prophet wasallam affirmed about Allah. We negate what Allah Azawajal negated about himself. And we negate what the Prophet wasallam negated about Allah Azawajal. This is the... What Ahl Sunnah and Ahl Hadith, this is the, the mokif that they had, the position that they had. And this can be symbolized and, uh, or it was very well articulated by Imam Malik, Imam Malik, Rahmatullah Ali, Rahmatan Wasiyah, one of our esteemed Salaf and one of the Fuqaha Al Arba, one of the four uh, Imams in which the Ummah. The Ummah of Ahl Sunnah follows uh, in fiqh that Imam Malik, Imam Dar al Hijra, he was the Imam teaching in the Prophet in Medina, in the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid, and he was asked uh, in his study circle, a man said, Ya Abu Abdullah, when uh, he was talking about the uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala rising above his throne, about you know Ar Rahman Ar Arsh Istawa. So this man said, Ya Abu Abdullah, Kaib Astoa. He said, O oh, father of Abdullah, how does he uh, rise? How does he rise above his throne? He was questioning about how does Allah rise above his throne? So Imam Malik became uh, very uh, emotionally shook up, you could say, angry. He had his head down and he began to sweat. So it shows you how the son of the, it's just like, where did this come from? You know, this is a, a strange su'al because this was the mocha of the salaf was clear. And he said, 
al kaif i said uh al istawa ma'lum wa kaif majhul wa sual anhu bid'a o kama qil so imam malik he said istawa it's known because it was known in the arabic language it wasn't the quran was revealed in arabic and the meaning was was known and clear it didn't require any secret knowledge or intuition but rather it's clear the meaning istawa ala arsh we we can't reinterpret or negate that meaning we accept it as it is al he said al istawa uh ma'lum wa kayf majhul and how is unknown we don't know how this is a athar azim and how was was unknown and then he said and asking about it is a bid'a and i i see you as a mubtadi'a i see you as an innovator and kicked him out of his circle so that shows you the mokif of ahlu sunna shows you the mokif of the salaf as salih that they had a strong mokif and how they affirmed the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they didn't distort them they didn't negate them they didn't make a ta'wil of them uh and they didn't ask how they just accepted those nusuls because they knew their intellect would not be the 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 appropriate judge everyone has a different intellectual capacity and we can't understand these ayat of sifat uh when it comes to the issue of how you know because it it's something we can't tasawwur we can't imagine <laughs> we can't imagine but rather we accept it as it is and we accept the meaning as is is known you know from a linguistic point of view but we 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 don't know the how we do not know the how so that shows us the minhaj the methodology of ahl sunnati wal jamaa with regards to sifat so imam ahmad al najmi rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatan wasi'a he said regarding this passage uh in shar sunna about sifat he said in the sifat allah tawqifiya yajibu an nasafuhu bima wasafa bihi nafsuhu fi kitabihi wa bima wasafuhu bihi rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi sunnatihi nuthbitu ma athbata al kitabu wa sunna wa natawaqqaf and dhalik so that's very important he just gave us some ibarat some statements which summarize for us the minhaj of the salaf give us those base principles that we need those basic principles that we need to be able to come back to to understand the sifat and move forward that we don't have to go into the in-depth uh, analysis that ahlul kalam tries to do with using their intellect allowing their intellect doesn't mean we don't use our intellect so it's very important to understand that point and that's a whole another uh set of issues ahlu sunna uses their intellect but they do not there's this is the difference ahlu sunna does not give their intellectual their intellect the overriding authority to overrule the text meaning we say for example ar rahman ala arsh istawa the most merciful rose above his throne in a manner that suits his majesty you know however however because we don't know the cave so there we draw the line our intellect falls under those ayat they fall within the realm of what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ahl kalam on the other hand they give precedence not in every situation obviously they don't just wish away the text but they give precedence taqdim al aql al naql as imam uh, sheikh al islam ibn taymiyah uh, referred to uh, about the minhaj of ahl kalam that they give precedence over their intellect to the text 
So with that same ayah, the same example we said, Ar-Rahman ala ars istawa, the most merciful rose above his throne, they will say, well, wait a minute. If we say Allah rose above his throne, this is the essentially uh, a part of the argument of Ahl Kalam. <clears throat> if we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rose above his throne, and you and I rise above our chairs and above our beds and, and things like this, then we're making a tashbi, we're making a resemblance. So here they begin to philosophize. They begin to try to intellectually deduce or reduce the text or to distort the meaning of the text to fit their intellect. So it becomes a... Uh, uh, a exercise in how to interpret and how to understand and how to, uh, you know, in essence, reform the text to fit their intellect, to make it fit, feel, feel, so they feel right about it. So that's then they end up negating some of the meanings or negating or uh, distorting the meanings or those who are Ahl Tishbi and you know the people of resemblance, or they make a resemblance. So they are fleeing sometimes in their arguments from one bid'ah to another bid'ah. Whereas Ahl Sunnah is safe and very simple. So let's go back to this Minhaj Rabbani <coughs> that the Imam said. He said, Verily, the sifat of Allah are tokhifiyah. That verily, the divine uh, characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are tokhifiyah. Itiqad is tokhifiyah. That means that there is no room uh, for debate and it is something, it's a part of our creed to believe it. It's a part of our creed uh, to believe it. It is the creed of the Muslim that they, they don't go into how, they don't know. These are things we believe. We can't test it in the laboratory. We can't give uh, examples. We can't go here and there, but rather we accept it. Tokhifiya. And we can't uh, change that and we leave it as it is. Okay? Ahl Sunnah, that's their minhaj. Versus, and that's the minhaj of Ahl Hadith versus Ahl Kalam. And he says that it's an obligation that we describe Allah by how he described himself in his book. And how his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, described him in his authentic sunnah. And affirm what the book in the sunnah affirmed about him. And that we stop within those boundaries. Meaning that we don't go beyond those boundaries. We don't transgress and say, well, I think it means, I think I can make an example from the creation. I think, uh, you know... Uh, if we say that, it's going to have this implication. No, Ahl Sunnah says la. And we'll give some other examples from the Sunnah. And then the Imam, he said, <clears throat> he said, نؤمن بما دلت عليه هذه صفات من المعاني. He said, and we believe, this is uh, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi saying, uh, explaining those, those, those uh, statements of Imam al-Muzni. He said, and we believe I mean, it's the belief of Ahl Sunnah with what those sifat mean in, in their meaning. We believe in their meaning because it's in, it's in the Arabic language. The Quran was revealed in Arabic, and for those who know the Arabic language and know the Arabic language well, they accept those meanings as they are, without distorting them and negating them, as we mentioned. Except. Then he says, إلا أنه يجب أن نعتقد بأن صفات الله جلت عن صفات المخلوقين. He said, except the point that we know, we believe that the character, the divine attributes of Allah, سبحانه وتعالى جل وعلا, uh, are that they differ from his his uh, creation. So that is uh, what is also mansus. It's also in the text as well. It's also in the book of Allah, as we mentioned, as we're going to mention now. He said, and free from resembling 
and make a resemblance between the creator and his creation, you know, his sifat, that this is uh, what Ahl Sunnah believes. And then he gives the ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem, لَيْسَ كَمِتْلِهِ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ سَمِيعٌ بَصِيرٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there is nothing which resembles him. And he is the all-hearing, all-seeing. From this ayah, we see the, the excellent example in a qa'id of Ahl Sunnah. That, uh, or, uh, so we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates in the beginning of this ayah. So this ayah contains nafi wal ithbat. <clears throat> this ayah contains nafi wal ithbat. <clears throat> what do we mean by nafi wal ithbat? This ayat in the beginning of the ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Laysa There is nothing that resembles him. There's nothing that resembles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these divine sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates it in its absolute sense. That there's nothing. So that right there destroys the argument of Ahla Tashbi. That right there is a rud, a refutation of those people who say that Allah is like this and he's like the creation and so on and so forth about the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in that ayat, there's an affirmation. Allah affirms that he hears and sees. Well, you and I hear and see. But Allah already told us in the first part of the ayat, he negated that there's a resemblance. So meaning that there is no resemblance, but Allah possesses hearing and sight, but his hearing and sight is perfect, whereas ours is naqs. His hearing and sight is perfect. He hears everything. He sees everything. You see something, you see what's in front of you. You can see with binoculars far away, with a periscope, with a microscope, you can see something detailed, but Allah sees everything. His sight is perfect. There's nothing in Allah. Verily, nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens and earth. Nothing. But so much is hidden from us. So that's why there's no comparison. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did say that he hears and sees. And we understand the meaning of hear and see. So we do understand the meaning as we, as uh, Imam uh, Ahmed al-Najmi mentioned, we understand the meaning, but that doesn't mean there's a resemblance because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates that resemblance. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also, if he could have it, Kareem, وَلَمْ يَقُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ and there is nothing that is co-equal or compar comparable to him. Comparable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing equal. So there, from those two ayat, we learn that there's nothing comparable to Allah and his sifat. There is nothing which is equal with him and his sifat. And there is nothing which resembles him in his sifat. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ahl Sunnah believes that. So it's very important for us to understand that. And those are some of the primary things that we need to understand with regarding the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything that's cre created will be destroyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sifat exists because they are part of him, Tabarak wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kitab al Kareem, Kullu min alayha fan. وَيَبَقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that everything uh, will be destroyed except for his, his face, which possesses al-jalali wal-ikram. So these are from, this is the divinity of your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's perfect. He's the only one worthy of worship. Nothing resembles him in the creation. A last point I want to mention, and, and this is what uh, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi mentioned about sifat. He said, sifat is of two types. The sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of two types. <clears throat> sifat of that tiyah was sifat al-fi'liyah. 
صفات الذاتية and صفات الفعلية صفات الذاتية he's talking about here that these are attributes these are saying that the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the divine attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are divided into two types one category of these uh, of his attributes to Barak wa ta'ala are referred to sifat of that meaning those attributes which are descriptors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself and we'll give some examples and the other sifat of fa'liya has to do with those characteristics those attributes that have to do with actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. So, for example, the sifat of that tia, when we talk about, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, kullu min alayha fan wa yabaka wajhu rabbika. So that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a wajh, the face of your Lord. We don't know how, but it's his tabarak wa ta'ala, perfect face, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we refer to that as the sifat of that tia. Those are, that is from his divine characteristics that he possesses. It doesn't have to do with an action that he does. Okay? Uh, وعينين, two eyes. That doesn't have to do with an action, but that is a characteristic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a attribute of your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he has two eyes. And asam, wal basr, is also from the dhatiyah. And they also are fa'li as well. So they, they are in both categories. That Allah uh, has uh, hearing and sight. That is describing him, Tabarak wa ta'ala, he, he himself. Those are descriptors, attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And two hands. We describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't take our intellect and we say how or how can we change the meaning or how can we negate the meaning but we go with those authentic texts in the book uh, we go with the Quran the divine speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we go with the authentic son of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and those things which are authentic authenticated about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we accept that without asking how and without distorting the meaning and without negating the meaning so those uh, have to do with characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his sock, his qadam, his foot, uh, asabi, you know, uh, fingers. All of this, we don't make a resemblance between the creation because this is what the people of Bid'ah, that they infer about Ahlul Sunnah. And I don't want to get too off into those arguments. I think we should keep that separate. But one of the arguments you'll have from some of the Ashadis and some of the other uh, people who are uh, distorted, uh, deviant in this uh, area of creed is that they will accuse Ahlul Hadith in the, in the past and in the present they accuse Ahlul Sunnah <clears throat> of, of being the people of Tashbi, of making a resemblance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you'll see things where they say, oh, their God looks like this and they'll make a picture. But no, that's not at all. These are their, from their inferences. Because for them, they infer that it means this and this and this, and they build something from that. But we accept what Allah says about himself, and we say that he is perfect in his sifat, and they are in a manner that suits his majesty. And the kafiyah, we leave it to Allah, those are amur al ghaybiyah Those are issues of the unseen we don't know. We leave it as it is. So there's a, a difference in men hats there. Alu also, that Allah uh, is above his creation. Okay? That is also from his, uh, those are from his, his, uh, that. And the fact that he's astoa, this is from his fi'liya. Astoa ala arsh. Uh, his hikmah, his power or ability. And his ilm, his knowledge, all of these are from his that. They have to do with the thatiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And then the sifat of fi'liyah, as we mentioned, have to do with the actions. 
uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is al-khaliq, he created everything. And that's an action. So those are from the sifat. He's al razik he's the provider of everything. That's an action. Okay, so those are from his sifat al fi'liya And also from his sifat al fi'liya as we mentioned, al istawa that he rose above his throne in a manner that suits his majesty. An nuzul they don't like to hear that, but nuzul because uh, the the Prophet والسلام, said in authentic hadith, I believe in Sahih Muslim, that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yanzalu Rabbuna tabarak wa ta'ala kulu thula fa layl al-akhir fa yaqul. He said, Our Lord, your Lord, Rab, Yanzalu Rabbuna, our Lord, descends to the lowest, last, every last night of the night to the lowest heavens. And he asked, he asked who? He asked the malaika. You know, who's making, seeking forgiveness? I will forgive him. Who's asking from me? And I will give him. So we know that from a, a text, from a hadith, authentic hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, Yanzalu Rabbuna, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, Kulu Layl al Akhir. He said, Our Lord descends every last third of the night. That lets us know Allah descends in a manner that suits His Majesty. So we don't ask cave, we don't ask how. But Ahl al I will claim Ahl al Sunnah. Uh, you know, what does that mean? It's such and such time in Seattle. It's such and such time in China. It's such and such time in, in uh, uh, the Oromo region. It's such and such time in Somalia. It's such and such time in Saudi Arabia. No. al Sunnah doesn't entertain those arguments. We don't know the how, and we leave it as it is. We describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He described Himself and as His, his Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described him. His Prophet alayhi wa sallam said, Yanzalu rabbana tabaraku ta'ala kulu thulutha layl al-akhir. So we, we say that. That's what we say. Ahl al-sunnah wal jama'ah. And that's the difference between Ahl al-sunnah and Ahl al-bid'ah in this uh, bab, the bab of sifat. So those are just some general points uh, with regards to this very important chapter. And we hope that... Uh, it was sufficient, and that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with ilm al-nafi, ruskin tayyibah, wa ilm al and forgive us of our many shortcomings, and anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jalla, anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan, until the next chapter, wa sallallahu wa sallam, ala nabiyya, na muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi, wa sallam.